Okay. Today we are going to be um, deriving the heat diffusion equation into Cartesian and spherical coordinates. Uh, we will be using this um, as well as the energy balance equation. Um, so first we will start off by looking at the energy stored, um, which is defined as the density times specific heat capacity, which is CP right here, um, times temperature, times the differential volume. Um, and we want to look at this as a rate, so we have to divide by um, um, delta time, and we will also take a differential of this. Um, and then our energy generated will be defined as a specific Q, um, which has units joules per seconds times meters cubed. Um, and these meters cubed have to be canceled out by, again, a differential volume. So right here, we're going to be utilizing this diagram right here. So the energy in is going to be defined as Qx, Qz, and Qy going into the differential volume right here. Um, and going out will be the energy out, um, which is in the x direction, qx plus dx. So it's taking into consideration the energy going in, as well as the energy at dx right here. Um, the position, the distance um, in the volume that we will be analyzing. Um, qy in the y direction is qy plus dy. And dz um, or in the z direction, heat flow is qz plus dz going out. Um, so to evaluate this right here, we'll be doing a Taylor series expansion. Um, so we can go ahead and look at that down here. Um, all right, so E in minus E out. So in the x direction, we have um, Qx minus Q, oh, I'm sorry, it's this way, Qx plus dx. And Qx plus dx is um, defined as Qx plus um, the differential of Q with respect to X times the volume here, dx. So looking at this, we can simplify it. It's going to have Qx minus a Qx minus um, delta Q over delta X times dx. So we can define this as negative delta Q over delta x times dx. In the y direction, it's going to be pretty much the same thing. Negative delta q over delta y times dy. And same with the z direction. Um, negative delta q with respect to z times dz. Um, OK, from there, we can combine all of these. And our equation looks like this. Um, so actually, um, where these are all constants, this um, differential volume, specific heat capacity, and density are all constants. So we can take that out of the differential. So you're going to have rho, specific heat capacity, differential volume, um, delta time, all divided by, or I'm sorry, temperature, all divided by delta time. Um, this is equal to Q times dv um, plus, and then we will just take all of these. We're going to have negative delta Q over delta X times dx minus, or yes, yeah, sorry, that's correct. Um, minus delta Q over delta Y times dy. 
um, minus delta Q over delta, oops, delta Z times D Z. Okay, <clears throat> I'm actually, if I can, nope, I cannot. I'm just gonna try to move it up a little bit, but that's okay. Next, we will be using the thermal conductivity equation, which I will write over here. Thermal conductivity equation, which is defined as um, heat flow is equal to area times heat flux. Heat flux is equal to um, the negative thermal conductivity coefficient times delta, or yeah, um, delta T. So differential temperature with respect to um, X, Y, or Z. Um, so for this, we will just use X as an example. So that's X, X. Um, okay, so in the X component, um, Q, this um, heat flow with respect to X is equal to um, negative um, thermal conductivity coefficient, um, or I'm sorry, area first. So let's do that first, area. And so if we look back at this, um, the area of flow going in in the um, X direction is going to be the Z component times the Y component. Um, and then, for example, for the Y direction, it will be DX times DZ, and the Z direction will be DX DY. So back over here, um, area, which will be for the X component, DY DZ times <coughs> negative K um, delta T over delta X. And then for the Y component, it's gonna be, as I said before, DX DZ times negative K delta T over delta Y. And then in the Z, for the Z component, it's going to be QZ is equal to DX DY. K delta T over delta Z. Um, so we can plug these in um, over here, um, which will give us <clears throat> over here we have rho C P differential volume times delta T with respect to time is equal to QDV plus, um, so we notice that there is a negative over here um, as well as negatives over here. So we will be um, taking out the negative for this. Um, so I suppose I can get rid of these parentheses over here. This will be minus. Okay. Um, so we have change in X, Q is over here, we get rid of the negative, we have dy dz times K, um, delta T over delta X, and, um, oh, I might run out of room, um, Oh, and then we cannot forget the dx over here. Then for the y component, uh, we will be doing plus um, change in y times this q over here, which is times dx dz times k delta t over delta y times dy plus um, now the Z component, which is DX DY. Um, negative is removed, so times K 
times delta t over delta z times dz. So um, this is the um, long equation, and we can actually simplify this even more. So um, dv is equal to dx times dy times dz. And for this cube here that we're looking at, it's so infinitesimally small um, that we can actually divide everything and remove, or divide dv by everything and remove it. So this will be canceled. We can use a different color. This will be canceled. This will be canceled. We have dy dz times dx. So these are removed. Same over here and over here. So with that, <coughs> we are left with um, density times specific heat capacity times change in temperature with respect to time is equal to Q um, specific heat plus delta with respect to X times K change in temperature over or with respect to x plus change with respect to y times k change in temperature with respect to y plus uh, change with respect to z times k change in temperature with respect to z. So this is the final equation after um, deriving the heat diffusion equation into Cartesian coordinates. And next we will derive the heat diffusion equation into spherical coordinates. Okay, <clears throat> now we will be deriving the heat diffusion equation into spherical coordinates. So, over here, um, you can see that there are three components. R is this, oops, um, R is right here along this highlighted line. Um, phi is this angle down here, and theta is this angle up here. And over on this side, you can see that the energy going in is going to be Q phi, Q theta, and Q r. The energy going out is going to be Q r plus d r, Q phi plus d phi, and Q theta plus d theta. The differential volume um, for these uh, spherical coordinates are going to be dr on um, this line right here, r d theta over here, and r sine d r, r sine theta d phi. Um, so again, we are going to start with the energy balance equation. Um, which is equal to the energy stored plus energy or is equal to energy generated plus energy going in um, to the uh, whatever is being analyzed uh, minus the energy coming out. Um, so first we'll look at the energy stored and it's gonna be the same as for the Cartesian coordinates. So it's gonna be density times heat um, capacity, specific heat capacity um, times temperature times differential volume. And um, again, we want to uh, look at this as a rate. So we are going to divide by um, change in time. And we will also take a partial derivative of that top there. Now, since um, density, specific heat capacity, and differential volume are all constant, um, this partial derivative is only going to apply to temperature. So we can rewrite this as rho specific heat capacity times differential volume um, times the change in temperature over change in time. For energy generated, again, it's going to be the same as Cartesian coordinates. We're going to have the specific heat, um, which has units joules per seconds times meters cubed. So we have to cancel out this meters cubed here by multiplying by the differential volume plus energy in minus energy out. And we are going to do each component over here, minus energy out. Um, so looking at the R component, we have energy going in in the R direction, 
which is QR, minus the energy going out, which is QR plus DR. And QR plus DR is defined as QR plus the change in Q divided by, um, or with respect to R, multiplied by dr, um, that distance. Um, so doing the math on this, this qr is going to subtract this qr, and then we will be left with a minus um, delta q with respect to r times dr. Same with the theta component, we're going to be left with a negative um, change in Q with respect to theta times d theta and phi negative um, change in Q with respect to phi times d phi. So um, now we are going to look at the um, thermal conductivity equation which again is um, heat flow is equal to area times heat flux. And heat flux is equal to negative, um, the thermal conductivity coefficient is K, times um, the change in temperature divided by um, respect to whatever um, component that we're going to be looking at. So, for example, R. Um, so, if we break this down, um, each component, the R component, is um, going to look like, and we can actually combine it with these equations over here. So we're going to get a negative times a negative, which will leave us with positive change with respect to R times um, that area is going to be, same with Cartesian coordinates, it's going to be the distance of the other two components, um, um, that area. So we are going to combine it with um, the equations on the left side. So it's going to be change with respect to R times that area, um, which is going to be the area, um, the distance of the other two components multiplied together. So for R, we will do multiply R d theta times R sine theta d phi, that is the area, times k, um, which is positive because the two negatives um, multiply together, um, times delta t, change in temperature with respect to r, and not forgetting this dr. Uh, for theta, we're going to have change with respect to theta times that area, which is going to be dr times r sine theta d phi um, times k, change in temperature with respect to theta times d theta. So um, for the phi component, it's going to be change with respect to phi times um, r d theta times dr. Um, is the area for that component um, times oops, there we go times k um, times sorry uh, delta t temperature uh, with respect to phi times d phi. So um, again. For the spherical coordinates, since the area, or I'm sorry, the volume is so small, we are going to divide that all the way through, um, and we can cancel out some components. So um, for the energy stored, that's going to cancel. Energy generated, this will cancel. So then we'll be left with, and I'll write it down here, rho <coughs> density times heat capacity times delta temperature with respect to time um, is equal to specific heat plus, and then we will be plugging in the rest of these components. So um, let's rewrite these so that it's a little bit more simplified. Um, so for R, we're going to have 
um, we can take anything out of that parentheses um, that does not change with respect to r. So um, that's going to be d theta. I'll write it over here. I'll write it up here. So that will be d theta um, sine theta and d phi and dr. Um, and then multiply by change with respect to r of everything left in there. So that will be these two r's right here. So r squared times k change temperature with respect to r. Um, so that is for the r component. And when we divide all that by the differential volume, um, let's take a look at that. So divide by this dr times r d theta times r sine theta d phi. We can cancel out several things. So we have dr cancel, d theta also cancels, and sine theta d phi will also cancel. So for that, we are left with um, 1 over r squared um, times change with respect to r of r squared k, uh, change in temperature uh, with respect to r. Now for the theta component, we can simplify this, take out anything that does not change with respect to theta. So we will take out the dr. We can take out another r here. Um, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and then we will also take out d phi is d theta at the end. And that looks like it's it. Um, yep, dr with respect to theta, so r d phi. Okay, and d theta over here. Um, so multiply that by change with respect to theta of sine theta. times k times the change in temperature with respect to theta. So yeah, this is the part that's more complicated um, than the Cartesian coordinates because the differential volume is much simpler to um, divide all the way through. Um, so you just got to make sure you count every step. Um, okay, <clears throat> so that looks like the end of that. Okay. Uh, but we will divide by differential volume. So we have dr times r d theta times r sine. Oh, I'll mix that. Sine theta d phi. Okay. So we can cancel out this dr. This r cancels d theta d phi. So, um, we are left with mm. Yes, that's right. Okay. So, we are left with 1 over r squared sine Yes, sine of theta um, time, multiplied by delta over delta theta times sine, there it is, theta times k, change in temperature with respect to theta. All right, now for the phi component, um, we can take out anything that does not change with phi. So... Um, we can take out r, d theta, 
dr and d phi. Um, and we are left with, so let's multiply by change with respect to phi times um, just k, um, change in time, or temperature with respect to phi. Divide that by the differential volume again, dr times r sine theta d phi times r d theta. So, looking at that, we can cancel out dr. This r um, sine theta is left in, d phi, and d theta. I'm sorry, r is. <laughs> yeah. Okay, is this supposed to be a sign? Or R, this R is left in. And this one is also. R D theta. That's okay. Okay, that makes more sense. Yep, even though I included the r squared over there. Okay, so now we have r squared. Um, okay, so I made a few mistakes here. Just, um... So this is supposed to be r d theta, and this is r sine theta d phi. So, um, so okay, we can cancel a few things out. Um, first off, okay, everything in the r in the, for the r component stays the same. Um, this R is going to cancel here, and for the phi component, this R will cancel, and sine theta can be um, taken out and put down here. So this will be divided out to the outside. Um, so... This will be r squared sine squared theta, and the r squared here um, is canceled. So there is an r squared down here at the bottom. Okay, so that's the um, sine squared, r squared, and we are left with delta phi, so change with respect to phi of k times delta t divided or, uh, with respect to phi. These are our final components, and we can put them into the full equation. So we started it down at the bottom here. So now we add in the r component. We have 1 over r squared um, times... Um, change with respect to r of r squared times k, change in temperature over change, or uh, with respect to r. Then um, we will have for the theta component is next, we have 1 over r squared sine theta, um, change um, with respect to theta, of sine theta times k um, times the change in temperature with respect to theta. And finally, for the phi component, we will have 1 over r squared sine squared theta um, multiplied by the um, change with respect to phi of 
um, thermal conductivity coefficient times the change in temperature over um, with respect to theta. Or I'm sorry, phi. So here is the final equation um, after deriving the heat diffusion equation into spherical coordinates. So clearly a little more complicated than the Cartesian coordinates, but it's relatively the same steps. Um, so yeah, thank you. In this video, we are going to be um, solving the finite differencing form of the heat diffusion equation in Cartesian coordinates, only using the x component and assuming no heat generation. Um, and then we will be solving and plotting a time varying temperature profile um, of a bar, but we'll be doing that later so we can get to that later. So we can start by um, making this into a second derivative. So we take out k and then we have change with respect to x times change in time with respect to x equals, oh, I'm sorry, um, then this becomes k delta squared t over delta x squared. And then this is equal to um, rho times specific heat capacity times change in time or uh, temperature uh, with respect to time. Um, and then from there, uh, we can call, or I'm sorry, we're going to divide um, rho times heat capacity um, from both sides, and we get k over delta squared t x squared equals change in temperature over change in time. Um, and then we are going to call this alpha. alpha. It's not a very good alpha, but that's okay. Um, and then from there, we are going to be translating it into this. Um, so on this side, so we have alpha delta squared t over delta x squared equals change in temperature with respect to time. Um, so on this side, let's see, we have move this down a little. Um, so this is going to be t j to the n plus one. Um, so we are looking over here. Let me change colors for a second. So this, um, the j, um, is position, which will be known as x. So x equals x times delta, or I'm sorry, j times delta x. And this is going to be time, which equals um, time equals n times delta t. Okay, so down here again, let's see, we have t sub j to the n plus 1 minus t sub j to the n over delta time. And this is actually, I switched these around here. Um, so this is the change in temperature. So change in temperature. So this is time plus one. So time in the future minus time in the present over the change in time. And that is equal to alpha, which will say the same for that. Um, and then the second derivative of time with respect to x. So to do that, we're going to do um, time or temperature position plus one to the n um, minus time position to the n over um, change in x. And then this is plus, or I'm sorry, minus um, again, tj to the n minus tj minus one, so one to the left, um, to the n. So here's one. Um, and then obviously divided by delta x. And then this is all um, also divided by the change in x. Um, because the second derivative 
it is divided again. Um, so this down here is technically x over 1, and you multiply 1 over delta x, and we see that does x squared on the bottom. Um, so for simplification, we will just teach it to the n, delta t equals alpha over delta x squared. We take that out. And then we have tj plus 1 to the n minus minus tj to the n. So that's minus 2 tj to the n minus plus, or a minus minus is a plus. So this will be plus tj minus 1 to the n. Um, now we can multiply delta t to this side and add tj to the n. So we get tj to the n plus 1 is equal to, added this, tj to the n, um, plus we have alpha delta t over delta x squared times, and then everything in here, plus 1 to the n minus 2 tj to the n plus tj minus 1 to the n. Okay, and um, <clears throat> we're going to call this R. Um, oops, that does not look like a J. There we go. Um, for our code, so this is the equation we're going to use for the finite differencing um, when we do the code in CoLab. Okay, um, just another thing, I forgot to <laughs> explain why we do... Um, T J to the n plus one. What would uh, I'm sorry. T uh, sub J plus one plus minus one. Um, so when we have our bar, so this is what it looks like. So let's say I'll add one more. Um, so let's say we have J right here. Um, one to the left um, is position. So that's going to be J minus one. So that's the previous one, and we have th if we have 350 Kelvin over here and 400 Kelvin over here, um, this one over here is going to be J plus 1. So the temperature profile that we are going to be plotting and solving in um, CoLab is basically going to use this equation to um, this equation right here to build a temperature profile of this bar. So this is going to start heating up faster and faster um, until it reaches um, an equilibrium temperature profile. Now that we've solved that equation, we will be using CoLab to plot a time varying temperature profile. So we're going to start by import numpy as np um, from plotly, plotly plots. Um, we're going to import make sub plots <clears throat> and uh, from plotly.io um, import or this is supposed to be import. Import plotly.io as pio. Okay and finally PIO.templates because we like this in dark mode um, equals dark. <clears throat> okay. Just check and make sure that works. Okay, great. So now we are going to input some variables. So we have NT is equal to um, and so these are our time, um, our sections of time. So you can really choose any number. Um, you can do 10,000, 20,000, 1,000. Um, let's just do 20,000 for this. Um, next will be NX, which is our uh, position section. So we can do 100 of those or 1,000 or whatever you like. And our R value is going to equal be equal to 0 0.1. Run that, shift enter, all right. <clears throat> so now we will do t is equal to np.full 
NX, 300. Oh, this should be a capital T. All right. Awesome. So this is going to give us an array of um, all the temperatures inside the bar um, at the initial time. So to show that, we can just T, Shift, Enter, and that will give us the array. So, oh, I'm sorry, actually. <laughs> One more thing I forgot to do. Um, we'll do that down here. Uh, so we have to... Um, we have to make sure our initial, um, the ends of each bar are at the correct temperature. So temperature at the zero end, which is the first uh, number, so the first plot in the array, uh, which would be T0, is equal to 350, and this has to be an integer. Then, um, oh, no, okay. And then on the other end, it will be 450 Kelvin. So um, in Python, that is T negative um, one is that number. So is 400. No, not that. OK. So now that we have that, we can show the array and it should look correct. So there we go. <clears throat> so initially, before the heat starts um, transferring into the rest of the bar, we have 350 degrees at our zero point, 400 or er, Kelvin at our zero point, and 400 Kelvin at the other end. And everything inside this bar, every other point inside that bar, is going to be 300 Kelvin because that is our initial um, temperature. All right. So from there, here's my mouse. Okay, <clears throat> we're going to get x is equal to np dot a, um, yes, a range. Okay. And our variable for that is nx. Um, so that is the, um, the x variable. Um, now we're going to try to actually show this plot that we've made, um, given everything that we've already put up here, these equations and everything, and all the initial temperatures. So we're going to do fig equals make subplots, and we're going to do rows. We need one row and one column equals zero. So, okay, that should work. Now we are going to do fig dot add scatter because we would like a scatter plot and our variables are going to be x equals x y is going to be equal to t this up here and nay or mode first mode is equal to lines and name we can call it um, initial or really anything that you want. So we're now we're going to create a for loop so that um, that keeps running through and running through until it reaches an equilibrium from reaching 350 Kelvin all the way to 400 Kelvin and it's um, linear progression all the way through. So for I in range um, one, oh, one and T No, yes, this should be here. Okay. So now we plug in our equation um, that we solved in the earlier step um, on paper. Uh, so we're going to get T, and this is going to be from for everything inside of that bar. So not counting the other two ends. Um, so that would be the zero and the negative one um, that we had mentioned up here. So we don't want to include those in this. So we are going to get, this is going to be our one number because this was zero. So from one, two, and 
Um, this is where it gets a little complicated because we, um, or confusing, I guess, because we mark this as t negative 1. But um, negative 1 here is actually going to be this number. So t from 1 to negative 1 includes everything in there. And that is equal to t from, <clears throat> again, 1 to negative 1, plus, and then we have r, yes, this, um, t, so r times t of, now we're going to include everything starting at this number. So this will be 0, 1, 2. And we are going to get that all the way to the end. So t to the end, you don't have to put anything after that colon. Um, and then we have minus 2 times t, same as these, because it's tj to the n, t from 1 to negative 1. And then after that is our tj minus 1 uh, variable. So we're going to get tj minus 1 is going to be everything from here. Um, so it's going to be negative 1, negative 2. And we will start at the beginning. So everything from here to here. So we can just do colon negative 2. All right. So next we are going to do if... Uh, zero, no, okay, if i modular 100, okay, that's, there we go, another colon down here. Um, now we are going to call in the scatter plot, so fig dot add scatter, and just reiterate our variables, x equals x, y equals, oops, y equals t, mode equals lines, and name, and we can actually, so that on the end uh, where the key is, where all the lines are labeled, we can actually do, so that you can see the actual temperature or the um, number that is being plotted. Um, so we're going to do f, and actually there should be, it's right here, I in the middle, and there we go. All right, so hoping that worked. Do fig.show, there we go, control enter. Hmm. Oh, I did call zero, that should be one, okay. Save that. Okay, another error. T one to negative one. <clears throat> okay, so T one to negative one. So you do T one to negative one plus R two zero one. Okay. Oh, okay. I forgot. Okay. Forgot to do multiplication there. So um okay. Let's see if that works. Okay, so yes, that worked. Um, all right, awesome. So we can actually keep running this through um, and it will show, hopefully, hmm. Um, mm, okay, <laughs> I see what I did wrong. Um, this also needs to be an integer. Okay, so let's see if I can, okay, that's much easier. Let's see if that worked. Okay, there we go. So I was only getting three <laughs> instead of 300. Okay, so 
That is our um, time varying temperature profile. Um, so now let's look at this if R is greater than 0.5. So let's see when R is 0.55, let's see what our um, plot looks like. Okay, clearly <laughs> not what it should look like. Um, fluctuates a lot from end to end. Um, but if we take this down to 0.5, then it's pretty much back to where it should be. Um, so in the next video, we will explain why um, R cannot be greater than 0.5. It has to be greater than zero and less than 0.5. Um, so we will be explaining that next. In this video, we will be using the von Neumann stability analysis to prove why R cannot be above a value of 0.5. As we saw previously, when we tried to um, make R equal to 0.55, we saw um, a lot of fluctuation and we saw that the temperature profile was approaching infinity, which we know is impossible. So we will use this stability analysis to prove why it has to between, be between 0 and 0 0.5. So, um, in the previous video, we used this equation right here, um, and this can actually be written as T sub K is equal to E to the I K X times E to the negative alpha K squared T squared. Um, we will also be using uh, Euler's formula to um, prove this, equal this um, is actually the same thing. Um, so first we will start by uh, deriving uh, these equations. Um, so on the left side, we are going to get I squared times, or, oops, times alpha times K squared E to the I K X um, due to the chain rule times E to the negative alpha K squared T. And on the right hand side, we will get, oops, we will get um, negative alpha k squared e to the i k x times e to the negative alpha k squared t. So these don't look exactly the same on both sides, but if we recall, i is an imaginary number and it is equal to the square root of negative 1. So if we square both sides of this, we get i squared is equal to negative one. So plugging that in, we get a negative alpha k squared e to the i k x times e to the negative alpha k squared t is equal to al negative alpha k squared e to the i k x e to the negative alpha k squared t. So now that we've proven these are the um, equivalent to each other, we um, can take this equation up here and actually uh, turn it into a summation. So it will be T sub K is equal to the summation from K equals negative infinity to infinity of some constant here, which is just a thermal conductivity constant, um, times E to the I K X times E negative alpha k squared t. So uh, we can rewrite this in our t sub j to the n form as t sub j to the, oh, to the n is equal to e to the i k um, k x. And since we want it in our t, um, our t sub j to the n form, uh, we are going to rewrite this as previously stated in an earlier video. Um, x is equal to n times delta x, and j is equal to, um, oh, I'm sorry, I have this reversed. n is our time variable, so it's going to be time is equal to n times delta time, and j is equal to x um, x equals j delta x. So plugging that in up here, x is equal to j 
delta x e to the negative alpha k squared um, n delta t. So now that we have that, we can plug this into the equation um, that we solved earlier, t sub j to the n plus 1 equals uh, t sub j to the n, etc. So I'll rewrite that full equation over here. So t sub j to the n plus 1 is equal to t sub j to the n plus r times t sub j plus 1 to the n minus 2 t sub j to the n plus t sub j minus 1 to the n. So now we are going to use this equation over here and plug it into in this parentheses right here. So doing that, we are going to get t sub j to the n plus 1 is equal to t sub j to the n. And we can actually take out a t sub j to the n all the way across. So we're going to get a 1 from over here plus r times, so this j plus 1 is equal to t sub j to the n times this right here, e to the i k x, delta x. So that will be e to the i k delta x minus 2, this t sub j to the n gets pulled out, um, plus t sub j, oh, to the n minus 1 is equal to t sub j to the n times e to the negative ikx. So with that we will get e to the negative ik delta x. All right, looking at Euler's formula up here, we know that e to the ikx is equal to cosine k delta x plus i sine k delta x, and e to the negative ikx is equal to cosine k delta x minus i sine k delta x. So if we plug those two right here into our equation down here, the i sine k delta x will be, um, it will have, it'll be cosine k delta x plus i sine k delta x minus i sine k delta x. So those will be canceled out. So we will get two, we'll be left with two cosine k delta x minus 2 in this parentheses right here. And then this will remain the same, 1 plus r t sub j to the n plus 1 is equal to t sub j to the n multiplied all the way across. All right, so we want to get r on its own so that we can get an um, inequality that proves why it has to be less than 0 0.5. So to do that, first we will look at this whole thing right here. So this has to be between negative 1, 1 plus r, 2 cosine k delta x minus 2. Um, so that has to be between 1 and negative 1. Um, and that's because if that parentheses is greater than the absolute value of 1, it's going to make this tj to the n plus 1 rise exponentially, which is what we saw in our time varying temperature plot, um, which was those fluctuations towards infinity. Um, so that's how we know that it has to be between 1 and negative 1. Um, also, or I, let's continue this. So we subtract 1 from either side and we get a negative 2 is less than r times cosine r times 2 cosine k delta x minus 2 is less than 1 minus 1 is 0. Um, and then we can divide 2 all the way out, and we get negative 1 is less than r cosine k delta x is less or minus one is less than zero. So um, if we take just the cosine of k delta x, 
we know that this has to be also between negative 1 and 1 because cosine is a wave function that is bounded by 1 and negative 1. So if we subtract 1 um, on every side, we get negative 2 is less than cosine of k delta x minus 1 less than 0. So this is the same um, equation as right over here. So we know that has to be between negative 2 and 0. Multiplied by r has to be between negative 1 and 0. <clears throat> so from there, we can use this equation as well as this one, or inequality as well as that one, and um, isolate r. So let's take from the upper bound, just on this right side here, let's look at that if cosine k delta x minus 1 is equal to 0. Let's look at that. It will be negative 1 is less than r times 0 is less than r. So this is not very helpful to us. It doesn't really tell us any kind of um, limitations r has. So let's look at the lower bound. Um, if r, or I'm sorry, if cosine k delta x minus 1 is equal to 2, we will have negative 1 is less than r times a negative 2 is less than 0. If we divide negative 2 all the way across, we get positive 1 half. Flip the sign because we divided by a negative, and we will get um, 1 half is greater than r, which is greater than 0. So this is what we're looking for right here. And so using the von, Neum von Neumann analysis, we can prove that r must be less than 1 half. Um, if it's greater than 1 half, again, we saw that instability in the plot from the previous video. Um, so, yeah, this proves that r must be less than 0 0.5. Previously, we used the von Neumann analysis to demonstrate the instability and limitations on r. Uh, now we will be using the Crank-Nicholson method, which will allow us to avoid that limitation on r. So. Um, we will start by using this equation that um, that we used previously, and we can differentiate that. Uh, we will start on the left side. We get t sub j to the n plus 1 minus t sub j to the n uh, divided by a change in time. And this is equal to alpha um, on this left side here. Alpha divided by delta x squared, uh, which comes from this right here, uh, multiplied by, and now we are going to um, uh, get an average of the two uh, different time steps. So first will be um, the time step in the future, so it will be t sub j to the n plus 1, and we're also going to be using the equation uh, previously, t sub j, I'll write it up here, t sub j to the n plus 1 is equal to t sub j to the n plus r, which is alpha times delta time divided by delta x squared. Uh, so r times t sub j to the n plus 1 minus 2t sub j to the n um, plus t sub j minus 1, oops, should be plus 1. So t sub j plus 1 to the n minus 2 t sub j to the n plus t sub j minus 1 to the n. So our future time step, which is going to be our first one here, is going to be t sub j to the n plus 1 minus um, 2 t sub j to the n plus 1 minus t or plus t sub j to the n plus 1. And this is my, or plus 1 over here and minus 1 over here. Um, that demonstrates the position. And uh, the n plus 1 is the future time step. So <clears throat> we're going to take this and add it to the current time step, which is just going to be 
t to the n. So we're going to get t sub j plus 1 to the n minus 2 t sub j to the n plus t sub j minus 1 to the n. And we need to take an average of this, so we're going to be dividing by 2. Um, so we can simplify this a little bit, and we will start by multiplying this delta t across to the other side, and we'll get it up here. And we can multiply this 2 um, down here. Well, we can just um, take it out of that parentheses, and we will call this r. So <clears throat> next we are going to add um, tj to the n to the other side. So we'll get t sub j to the n plus 1 is equal to t sub j to the n plus r times. And now we can start, um, or we can remove these parentheses. So our first time step. Um, t sub j plus 1 to the n plus 1 minus 2 t sub j to the n plus 1 plus t sub j minus 1 to the n plus 1. Oops. So that would be plus t sub j plus 1. Our current time step is n minus 2 t sub j to the n plus t sub j minus 1 to the n. Okay, <clears throat> now we are going to start combining like terms. So we want to get our future time step, the n plus 1 time step on the left side of the equation, and our current time step, which is um, t to the n on the right-hand side. So to do that, we are going to have t sub j to the n plus 1. r is going to be multiplied all the way across throughout this whole parentheses. So we will get a minus r times t j plus 1 to the n plus 1. So that's that first one. Um, and then minus 2r, so we'll be adding that. So plus 2r t sub j to the n plus 1. And then we will get a minus um, r times t j t sub j minus 1 to the n plus 1. So that is everything on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, this t sub j to the n is going to stay c sub j to the n. And then we will get plus r t sub j plus 1 to the n minus 2r t sub j to the n. There's those two. Um, plus r times t sub j minus 1 to the n. Okay. Now that we have that, um, we're going to organize it uh, because we will be doing a matrix um, in a minute. So it's easier to look at it when this J, these J plus ones are on the left, this J is in the middle, and the J minus one is on the right, which is what we've been doing in our previous equation. So let's combine those. So first we are gonna have negative R times T J plus one to the N plus one. So that one is taken care of. And then we have two that are the same here, this um, t sub j to the n plus 1. So we are going to get uh, plus t sub j to the n plus 1 times 1 plus 2r. And then we will get minus r times t sub j minus 1 to the n plus 1. We're going to do the same thing to the other side. So we're going to have r times t sub j plus 1 to the n. Um, plus t sub j to the n times 1 minus 2r uh, plus r times whoops, t sub j minus 1 to the n. <clears throat> we can simplify this a little bit further by taking out the t j to the n plus 1 and t j to the n on the right side and plugging in Euler's equation um, to help start explain why r has no limitations using the Crank-Nicholson method. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to take out t sub j plus 1, or t sub j to the n plus 1, and we will have a minus r times, since it's j plus 1, we're going to have e to the i k x 
plus 1 plus 2r minus an r, and we have j minus 1, so it'll be e to the negative i k x. Same thing on the other side, we'll take out a t sub j to the n, we have r plus 1 minus 2r. Oh, I forgot the... So we will have r times e to the i k x because of the j plus 1 plus 1 minus 2r plus r times e to the negative i k x because we have that j minus 1 over there. Okay, um, simplifying this even further, we can divide this by both sides and we'll get t sub j to the n plus 1 is equal to t sub j to the n and when we get this, we can simplify it to 1 minus 2r times, as previously uh, determined, 1 minus cosine. Um, we know that this combination of e, k, e to the ikx um, plus e to the negative ikx is 1 minus cosine of k delta x. Um, and we're going to divide that by 1 plus 2r times 1 minus cosine of k delta x. <clears throat> so looking at this portion right here, we know that this is going to be less than 1. And that is because um, anything that is 1 minus, as you can see, 1 minus 2r, etc., 1 plus 2r, um, we can call that whatever is here, we can call that w for now. Anything 1 minus something divided by 1 plus something is going to be less than 1. And this is good because um, if this is less than 1, then t sub j to the n plus 1 is equal to t sub j to the n times something that is less than 1. So this tells us that this right here is going to be less than t sub j, oh, wrong way, um, less than t sub j to the n plus 1, which is what we want to see. And so this proves that there are no limitations on r. Now we will be plugging in this equation right here into a matrix. So we are going to start using this um, on the left hand side, which is the um, plus one time step, so the uh, time in the future. Um, looking at that, this is the t sub j to the n plus one, and the coefficient of that is one plus two r. And on the right hand side, so the j plus one, the coefficient is negative r, and same on the left side. And so this is going to translate all the way down through this diagonal of the matrix, it's going to be 1 plus 2r, and on the left and right hand side for each of those is a negative r. Okay, and in this matrix right here, um, we are going to have our boundary conditions on the top and bottom outside of the matrix, and this is going to be t sub j equals 0 because it is our um, first uh, point which is 350 Kelvin and this is the n plus 1 um, so that is going to be j e t sub j equals 0 and down here is going to be our other boundary condition which is 400 Kelvin so if we take a bar that has three four let's say one oh, one two three four so six steps in there, we can do j equals 5. This is going to be the 400 Kelvin boundary and 350 on this side. So this is our n plus 1. And inside here, we are going to have t sub j equals 1 to the n plus 1, t sub j equals 2 to the n plus 1, t sub j equals 3 to the n plus 1, and t sub j equals 4 to the n plus 1. So that is what the left-hand side of the equation looks like in a matrix. And on the right-hand side, we are going to have in this first row, we're going to have four lines. So in the first one, we're going to have R times 
t sub j plus 1, so our j here is 1, so that's going to be t sub 2 to the n, um, plus t sub j to the n, or t sub j, which is um, 1 to the n times 1 minus 2r, plus r times t sub j minus 1, so that'll be 0, to the n. And in this row, we have to include the boundary conditions. So for this one, it's going to be plus r times t sub 0 uh, to the n, which is our 300 Kelvin, or 350 Kelvin. So next we have r times t sub uh, j plus 1, so 3 to the n plus t sub 2 to the n times 1 minus 2r plus r times t sub 1, j minus 1, to the n. And we don't need to include the boundary conditions for this one um, or the next one. So next is r times t sub 4 to the n plus t sub 3 to the n times 1 minus 2r plus r times t sub 2 to the n. Finally, we have r times t sub 5 to the n plus t sub 4 to the n times 1 minus 2r plus r times t sub 3 to the n. Um, and then we are going to add our other boundary condition down here, which is r times t sub 5 to the n, and that's the 400 Kelvin. So uh, this is our matrix, and next we will be doing the code. Now we are going to be plotting a temperature profile using the matrix and the Crank-Nicholson method that we just previously did. Um, if we look back at our code from before, uh, when we went over 0 0.5 for R, it um, resulted in an instability um, for this plot. Now we're going to show that it no longer has any limitations uh, due to the Crank-Nicholson method and using this matrix. So, um, for example, we can do R is equal to uh, 0 0.8, uh, which is clearly more than 0 0.5. Um, now we will plot our T array, so NP dot full, um, oops, um, NX and 300. Next, we will be defining our boundary conditions. So T of 0, which is the 350 Kelvin boundary condition. Um, and remember, it's 0 and not 1, because in Python, the 0 is the initial. So that is equal to 350. Oh, no. OK, <clears throat> and our t negative 1, which is at the other end of the bar, is going to be equal to 400 Kelvin. Now that we have that, we can do a equals np dot zeros. Um, and um, in our matrix, we are going to have three diagonals and um, It'll be nx minus 2, and it's minus 2 because oh, there are two parentheses here. It's minus 2 um, because of the oops, <laughs> the two boundary conditions. Um, so next we will do a um, initial is or um, so a we're looking at that first diagonal. It's going to be um, 0 um, to the end is equal to negative r and enter okay for the middle from 1 to the end is going to be 1 is oops, equal to 1 plus this plus 2r or 2 times r um, and then our a the third diagonal um, is going to be negative r again. So now that we have that, we are going to do b is equal to, we're going to be using um, the equation for t. Um, so uh, r, lowercase r, times t. And this is going to be 2 to the end. 
because it begins at t2. And then we will have plus t uh, j to the n. Um, so we can actually do plus, we'll do 1 plus 2r, that's the coefficient, times t from 1 to negative 1, so that's everything in between, that's uh, tj to the n. And then we will have that plus r times t of colon negative 2. Okay, now we can define our b of 0 is equal to, um, and these are our boundary conditions, so the 350 Kelvin and the 400 Kelvin. So this will be b of 0 plus r times t of 1, or um, t of 0. And then b of negative 1, which is the other boundary condition, is equal to b of negative 1 plus r times t of negative 1. Okay, now that we have that, so that is our initial. So we can go ahead and plot that. So we're going to name figure 2 is equal to make subplots define our variables x equals x y equals t um, and for this we don't need a mode so we can just do name equals initial 2 okay um, oh forgot to do one thing so figure 2 equals um, make subplots yeah, I mixed this up a little bit. <laughs> Make subplots parentheses. So this is fig2 dot, oops, dot add underscore scatter. So that will um, make our plot. So shift down to, let's see if that works. Okay. Um, I just had to rerun it through, so that actually is working. Um, but there's an issue with this now. Maybe, maybe I was supposed to have this parentheses on the outside. Let's try that. Run off. Okay, perfect. So that is our initial plot. Now down here, we are going to start a for loop. So we're going to say for i in range, um, we are going to do the time steps plus 1, and colon. We will have t from 1 to negative 1. Um, oh, I'm going to write this real quick. Um, solve banded. Um, one to one, so A and B, A, B, and actually up here, we're going to put in um, from, I believe it's psi, chi dot lin alge. Yep, that looks right. Okay, import, um, solve banded, there it is. Oh. Okay, so now that we have that, so we had to import um, that banded, solve banded because we were using a banded matrix. <clears throat> okay, now continuing our for loop, we are going to repeat these equations here and just copy and paste that down here. Make sure everything is lined up correctly. All right, let's see. Next, oh, if I, um, modular, let's do a thousand this time. I believe we did a hundred last time. Let's see. Yep, a hundred. So we can do a thousand this time. Equals zero, or yeah, 
Um, okay, oops, know what I forgot. Okay, so now we're gonna do to fig two dot add underscore scatter. Redefine our variables, um, <clears throat> y equals t, and name equals i. Okay, so if we did all that correctly, fig2.show should give us the full plot. And since we had to add the solve banded, I'm going to run from the beginning. Oh. Hmm. Banded. Okay, so a couple things I noticed that need to be changed. This needs to be multiplied, not added. And um, this is 1 minus r, actually, um, because we are looking at the right side of that equation. So 1 minus r. Um, so looking at this, t, 1 to negative 1 equals solve banded one and one a and b okay let's see that works and oh, it worked okay awesome um cool so let's actually try a hundred maybe that will no okay <clears throat> okay so um, this is the time varying temperature profile um, after using the Crank-Nicholson uh, method to solve into that matrix and plotting it into this. So again, we can use a um, R value greater or less than 0.5. So for example, if we have 0.2, That also still works. Um, and, you know, we can have r is equal to 1. So, as we can see now, there are fewer limitations to r. It does not have to be less than 0.5 um, to have an accurate temperature profile. So, thank you.